Good morning, Redemption. Thank you for joining us this morning for our online and in-home worship. You know, at Redemption, we remain committed even in these days to uh, being a vertical church where we want to glorify God through the fulfillment of the Great Commission. And so uh, these unique times have presented some challenges to that, yet we remain committed to glorifying God. So thank you for joining us now in your homes as we seek to exalt Christ together. Like every Sunday, we're going to sing together, pray together, give together, open God's word uh, together and, uh, and fellowship and connect with the Lord and one another. So I pray that you will be able to do that even in your home this morning, knowing that you are gathered with the body of Christ even though we are scattered uh, all across our city and our state. Maybe you're even watching this uh, uh, outside of Texas and we wanna welcome you as our guests this morning uh, to Worshiping with Redemption Bible Church. You know, this morning it would make sense to open up God's Word uh, together, to open our worship. And so would you turn in your copy of God's Word, would you open up your Bibles to Hebrews 12? I want us to look to Christ together as we read Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Listen here as I read it. It says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. This is God's word for God's people. And what a great verse, uh, what great verses really to uh, begin our worship as we come now to look to Christ, the one who's seated on his throne. So would you pray with me now as we uh, turn our attention to worshiping together today? God in heaven, here we are as your people. Would you come now and be uh, present among us by your spirit as we worship? God, help us to set aside distractions, help us to uh, see clearly and repent of our sin, and help our, uh, the affections of our heart be turned towards you, Jesus, the one who is seated on the throne, the one who with great endurance faced the cross in our place. And so we want to worship you now in Christ's name. And God's people said, Amen. We're going to sing some songs now together. Christ is exalted. He is on his throne. And so go ahead there in your home. Why don't you stand uh, together uh, as uh, Aaron and his team lead us in these songs. Now as you sing, I just encourage you to sing out. You may remember the time, the, the first time you prayed out loud in front of a group of people and it was maybe a little nerve wracking. You're a little anxious. And today might be that as you lift your voice, as you sing alone or with the group of people that you're gathered. But just remember, you sing for the Lord. You're singing for an audience of one. So whether you're out of tune or out of key, it doesn't matter. Just lift your voice. Let's sing these songs together, shall we?
Now's the point in our worship where we get to pray and to give together. You know, at Redemption, we are committed to unceasing prayer, to praying with and for one another. And so like we would do as we were gathered together, we would pass our connection cards and those connection books to share prayer requests with one another. And now I can't hand you that thing uh, right now, but what you can do is to go onto our socials, uh, onto Facebook or Instagram, and you can DM us, direct message us a uh, prayer request so that we can be praying with and for you. I would encourage you to do that even now. You can push pause uh, on this video and go ahead and submit uh, a prayer request there so we can be praying uh, for you this next week. Um, you can also, if you'd like, just pause it and pray with the group that you're gathered. Pray that uh, God would continue to uh, open your mind as we uh, give and uh, open his word together. Um, would you also hear as, we're, as you're on our, our socials, why don't you, uh, just for the sake of, of unity and, and seeing who's gathered together, maybe now you could just take a picture of who's gathered there and uh, go ahead and leave it in the comments section on our post so that way we can see who's gathered and who's worshiping together. It's also now our time to where we can give to the Lord. The ministry needs continue. The, uh, the work of, of the gospel uh, continues on uh, through our church, um, through you, through the, uh, the generosity of, of our church members, for those of you that are worshiping with us today. And so even though we can't be here in person to gather, you can do that online. You can go to our website, redemption.bible slash give, or you can text the number there on your screen and uh, you can make a gift today. Why don't we pray now? I'll lead us as we uh, pray for uh, you for the gifts that are being given. God in heaven, thank you that you are our God of provision, that you know all of our needs and you uh, provide for us uh, every day, every season of our lives. And so this is uh, not a new season. Lord, we trust you. We trust you and uh, for our physical, our material needs. And so would you, God, uh, would you, as you've blessed us, would you help us to uh, bless you? Would you give us a spirit of generosity and kindness and compassion and joy just as we uh, uh, seek to uh, continue the ministry, to continue the gospel through Redemption Bible Church? Provide for our people. Would you bless them as they uh, uh, bless you today? We pray these things now in Christ's name, amen. Turn in your copy of God's Word now to Mark chapter 15. Continue in our series through uh, the book of Mark and this portion of Mark uh, titled, In My Place. And so as you grab your Bibles, you want to turn there. You also probably want something to take some notes so you can follow along, whether on your device or uh, a piece of paper there. But uh, in order to help you follow along, to dig into the Word uh, with me, 
uh, you probably are going to want one of those things. So even if you need to pause it and go grab something right now if you're unprepared, hopefully you have it, you're eager, you're ready, um, just like you would be every Sunday to dig into the Word here. It's really been a, a week, hasn't it, church? It's been a, a week as everything's now on lockdown, as uh, uh, there's been these increased measures to help prevent the spread of the coronavirus. And I uh, uh, hope that you are uh, staying safe, that you are staying uh, hopeful and joyful there, even as you may have uh, been shut down. Maybe you're not working or maybe you're working from home or uh, that's just the rapidly changing situation that we find ourselves in. So keep committing yourself to praying and, and uh, um, we'll uh, trust that uh, God will work all things out for His glory and our good, and uh, we'll see what uh, God's Word really has to say uh, to that effect. And, um, and that's really the thing. Like, everybody has something to say right now, don't they? Everybody uh, seems to uh, have an opinion or want to inform us of the increased measures that they're taking. So I don't know about your email inbox, but it seems like everybody that has my email, um, every enterprise from banks to uh, insurance to uh, the, you know, the mailing list that I'm on, everybody has something to say about it. And everybody seems to be making videos, right? Like if you just go onto your Facebook and you go onto your feed, it's like, well, there's a video of somebody praying. Here's a, you know, another video of somebody praying. ESPN, of course, has a funny meme or something to say about it. Uh, you know, there's a pastor. Uh, Dave Ramsey has something to say about it. John MacArthur, uh, friends, everybody. Our, like our, our social media is just blown up with videos and, uh, and uh, you know, encouragements. Everybody, you know, well-meaning, I think, but uh, they all know that we're online. And in a day like today, we can be overloaded with voices. Everybody is competing for our attention as new reports come out, and here's reports, and that's fake news, and this is real news, and it all just becomes chaos. We ask the question like, well, what's true? Who, who do we believe? You know, it's almost like we, we're living in a time where uh, there's a bunch of kids playing over at our house and you're the parent and all the kids all of a sudden are like erupt and, and arguing and, and bickering and fighting and somebody's crying and this one's yelling and that one's sobbing and this one's running away and they all start screaming and blaming at the same time and they're, uh, some are even telling you as the parent to, what to do like that one needs a spanking, that one needs to go in time out, she did this, he did that and you just don't know who do you believe what's true in the midst of all of this? And I would just encourage you, church, as you're bombarded with all the voices, is that it's not always the loudest, the most adamant shouter that is always right. I would actually submit to you that you should listen to what the silent, steadfast one may be saying. Listen to what the silent, steadfast one is saying. See, here's the thing. If you're taking notes, you want to write this down. In the chaos, silence can speak the loudest. In the chaos, silence can speak the loudest. And as we come to Mark 15, what Jesus is not saying is maybe the most profound thing. And Mark highlights this actually for us in Mark's account of these events leading up to his crucifixion. So hopefully you've had time now to get in your Bible. So why don't you grab it here? I want to read Mark 15, 1 through 20 for us. Grab it here. I'm in the ESV translation. You can follow along as I read. This is what God's word says to us. Mark 15, beginning in verse 1. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked again of him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. And among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. A crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. And he answered them saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? And he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priests had delivered him up. 
But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. The soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him, and they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. When they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. This is God's word for God's people. You know, what makes Mark's account of these events different or unique from Matthew and Luke and John is the brevity of the details. And this has been the case throughout uh, the whole book of Mark. He's recorded things not uh, as exhaustive or with as thorough of details as some of the other writers. He's been brief and urgent, but he has a point, a reason in writing to his, uh, to his readers and to us. Matthew, Luke, and John, they include some other events. They include some other conversations in these proceedings here. You know, they may highlight the physical agony more or the deeper discourse that Jesus had with Pilate or between Pilate and uh, and Pilate's wife or uh, even the proceedings then with Herod. But here with Mark, it's Jesus' silence that is deafening. It's what he isn't saying. As if all the sheep are bleeding and freaking out and there's one sheep that is silent not making any noise, it's standing quiet, and it draws our attention. Why? Why is this one quiet? Well, this reveals our first point, that silent Jesus was sentenced in my place. Silent Jesus was sentenced in my place. Come now to verse 1 with me. The sun rises here, we're told, uh, after the late night proceedings with the Sanhedrin. You know, if you uh, joined us last week, if you're familiar with the end of chapter 14 there, the Sanhedrin was accusing Jesus. They had arrested him and, uh, and now uh, con- and accused him, condemned him of uh, being guilty of blasphemy. They consult together, and as Jesus has claimed to be God, or they have charged him, and he has answered in the affirmative. Now morning has come and they consult together and they look what it says here at the end of verse 1 and they delivered him over to Pilate. After they bring this accusation, these charges against Jesus, they now take him to Pilate just as Jesus had told them. Just as he had said, as he said he would be delivered over, he would be handed over. You remember Jesus' words here, flip back uh, in your Bible, go back over to chapter 9, the second time that Jesus tells his disciples that he would be betrayed and condemned. Chapter 9, verse 31, Jesus is speaking and he says, He was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be, here it is, delivered into the hands of men. And they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. Prophetic words Jesus had told them not long before. He said it a second time in chapter 10. Go uh, over there, another page, chapter 10, beginning in verse 32. They're walking on the road. They're amazed that those who, uh, and those who followed were afraid. And he takes the 12 and he begins to teach them, it says, to tell them what was going to happen to them. And in verse 33, Jesus speaking here, he says, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be, here's that word, delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, and after three days rise again. Jesus had told them not long before exactly what would happen. And now we find ourselves in the midst here in chapter 15, things going exactly as Jesus had said. They deliver him over to Pilate. Well, who is this man? Pilate was, a, he was the prefect 
of Rome. He was a Gentile or a Roman uh, ruler of that region. It might be uh, kind of similar to like our local state representatives. He reported to Herod. He, uh, um, uh, were unlike our representatives where they represent the people uh, to the state or to the governing authorities here, no, uh, uh, and, and their way of thinking, no, really, Pilate represented Rome to the people. He was Rome's present there, presence there as a ruler. And so he's there. And, you know, Pilate isn't really concerned as they bring Jesus uh, to him with the charge of blasphemy. That's not really uh, his jurisdiction. That's a religious concern. But what he is concerned with is the potential political uh, uh, threat that Jesus may be against Rome. You know, there had been many that had been uh, risen up to try to leave, lead the Jewish people uh, in rebellion against the Roman Empire. And so he asks them and uh, asks Jesus in verse 2, he says, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus' answer here is very interesting. Um, he answers really, you know, uh, it's, it's not really an affirmation, but more of an acknowledgement. As he says, the emphasis here, he's saying, you have said so. Now, these are the only words in our passage that Jesus speaks in this whole account where he says, well, you, yes, Pilate, you have said so. And it's as if he's really saying yes, but not in the way that you mean this. See, Pilate was thinking politically. He was thinking of Jesus as a political threat, as, you know, he, you know, they misinterpreted his uh, things that he would uh, tear down the temple. Jesus says this, and then in verse 3, the chief priests, they begin to heap on more accusations. And you can almost hear them as they are, are in the uh, courtroom, so to speak, of Pilate's chambers here. You can hear him saying, well, he said this, and you should know he said that. And they're heaping it on more and more and more. And all the while, Jesus makes no defense. So much so that we're told in verse 5 there that Pilate is amazed. He's amazed. As all these chief priests, as really the whole force of Jewish religious authority are heaping these accusations upon Jesus, and he is silent. Pilate is amazed, as should we. After all, we've seen time after time Jesus brilliantly answer all who would try to trap him. Haven't we seen that, church, all throughout Mark? Somebody comes, they try to trap him, they try to, you know, to kind of back him into a corner with his words, and Jesus always has words uh, to get out of it. And uh, why is he silent now? It's because his hour had come. He would be delivered over for us in our place. See, if you're taking notes here, write this down. We deserve to be delivered over for our sin. We deserve to be delivered over for our sin. Here, Jesus is standing before the authorities with heaps of accusations being hurled upon him and all of them false. He is innocent and blameless in every case. And yet for us, the account of our sin would fill many pages. If they were read aloud, we would be in court for hours, if not days and weeks, as all the charges against us were brought against us. See, we deserved a scene like this, yet here is Christ in our place before the authorities, bearing the sting and the weight of these false accusations. It's in verse 6 then that the scene shifts from the courtroom to the courtyard where the crowd had gathered. It appears here that, uh, you know, maybe you get the sense that Pilate knows Jesus is innocent he knows that Jesus was innocent, but I think maybe in an effort to not look weak or to really transfer responsibility, he didn't want to be the one responsible for uh, condemning Jesus to death. And so he invites the crowd into this. And during the Passover feast, apparently, uh, they had a tradition of granting amnesty to one uh, who was in prison. Now, we only get this from the scriptures here, but um, this was apparently something that he had done. It had become a tradition and the crowd is asking that uh, Pilate would do the same in this case. And there's lots of irony in this scene as Pilate engages the crowd. 
There's, there, there's all kinds of irony in a comparison of these two that are put before the crowd, the one that the crowd calls for and the one that Pilate is putting out before them, this murderer named Barabbas. The murderer named Barabbas. And there's some irony here even in his name. And the construction of his name, Bar in, in uh, Hebrew means son or son of. And Abba is, do you know it? Father. That's right. An affectionate name for a father. So put those things together. Son of the father. And so here on one hand, you have the murderer who's the son of the father. And on the other hand, you have the Messiah who is the son of the blessed one. The son of God. Who would go free? In one case, you have the leader of the insurrection, one who had uh, led the rebellion against the Roman occupation. And on the other hand, you have the king of the Jews. Who would go free? I think Pilate here gets the irony, and if not, Mark sure uh, does a good job at drawing it out for us. And so these two men are put before the crowd, and you see here uh, as, as uh, Pilate asks them, well, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? He's almost prying them. He's, he's goading them a little bit because he knows that they have some envy. He knows that uh, they have been scheming for a long time to try to uh, trap Jesus and try to kill him. And in verse 11, then, as Pilate is putting it before, you can see the chief priest. It says they're stirring up the crowd. He, he, they're, they're goading them. They're inciting the crowd to say these things. You know, you can picture in your mind a rally or demonstration, you know, outside a courthouse. Somebody has an agenda. They want to be heard. And so they gather a crowd outside the courthouse with their pickets and their signs and their chants and their shouting. There's somebody inciting, somebody goading them, and they cry out that the murderer, Barabbas, gets to go free and for the Messiah to be crucified. In verse 14, here Pilate again puts before them, well, what evil has he done? What, on what charge could we crucify this man? There's no answer. There's no reason. There's no justice here. But the people pleaser Pilate just gives the crowd what they want. He wishes to satisfy them, verse 15 says. And so Barabbas is released and Jesus is first scourged or brutally beaten with a whip. On the end of the whip strings, there would be these shards of bone or metal and after being brutally beaten, then delivered over to be crucified. And all the while, no peep from Jesus. I don't know about you, but welling up in me, I was like, Jesus, say something, anything. Why, why are you silent? Why be quiet now? This is unjust. Why is he silent? Because his hour had come. Sinners go free while the sinless one stands condemned in our place. See, if you're taking notes here, you need to write this down. We were guilty and go free too. We were guilty and go free. We, like Barabbas, were guilty and Jesus, the innocent and blameless one, is condemned. And again, this, this makes me want to like cry out for Jesus. If you're going to be silent, then I'm going to say, this isn't fair. This, this isn't right. That's the whole point. It's the wonder of the gospel, beloved. That the innocent one would die in our place. That we were guilty and we get to go free. How is that right? How is that fair? And only God could use an unjust situation like this for His glory and our good. See, in verse 16 then, the scene shifts again from the courtroom to the courtyard and now to the headquarters where bloody, wounded Jesus is led. 
It says there in verse 16 that they lead him away into the governor's headquarters and they call together, look at this, the whole battalion, the whole battalion or the, or the cohort. Remember last week as, the, as all the cohort, as those soldiers came with their lanterns, torches, and weapons to come and arrest Jesus, this, some 100, maybe even 200 soldiers or so that had arrested him, they now gather them in this headquarters and they mock and ridicule Jesus mercilessly. You know, this isn't just a few guys in a back room. This is a whole battalion of soldiers mocking and ridiculing Jesus. Our Lord. They throw on an old purple robe, they, you know, like, like a king might wear, and they put a crown of thorns on his head to mock his royalty. But there's some symbolism here, some imagery, as they place this crown of thorns upon Jesus' head, a sign of the curse of sin. Remember way back in Genesis 3? After Adam and Eve disobeyed God and sin was brought upon this earth and everything in it being cursed and the earth being cursed and through a sign of thistles and thorns. And ever since that point, we've worked by the sweat of our brow to work and keep the land. And now in some spiritual imagery here, the curse of sin is set upon our Lord. And the soldiers then begin to bash him upon the head, sinking those thorns in deep, but yet again drawing more blood from our Lord. They spit upon him as he told them they would and act just as insulting then as it would be now. They're kneeling down, they're jeering before him, hoping to provoke him in some you know, mockery of this man. And yet nothing no fighting back, no words, no defense, just silence. After a time, we don't know how long, they can't get anything out of Jesus, and so they, it says they take it all off him. They strip him of the cloak, they put his own clothes back on him, and they lead him out to crucify him. Why? Why is Jesus silent still? Because the hour had come. Because the hour had come where Jesus took all the consequences for our sin. Here's another point. Write this down. We deserved punishment for our sin. We deserved punishment for our sin. Sin isn't just something that is simply swept under the rug. Forgiveness doesn't mean that we just overlook the consequences. As a matter of fact, in Romans 6, we're told that the wages of sin is death. Meaning the consequence, the reward, what is paid out for sin is death. The ultimate consequence. And here, in, you know, we see the greater the offense, the greater the punishment. See, sometimes I think we fail to recognize the vertical aspect of our sin. We, we fail to recognize that even when we sin horizontally against someone else, that there is always a vertical part to our sin. See, when I sin against my wife in some way, it is not just something horizontal between her and I. It is also a sin against God as I have abdicated my responsibility, as I have treated with contempt or with sin somebody who's been created by, by God, somebody who is valuable and worth uh, uh, so much to the Lord. See, we trample upon His glory as we trample upon our wives. See, when we're angry, this isn't just an internal sin. This isn't just something that we you know, take out as we lash out upon one another. No, it's a vertical sin as we, as, as we give ourselves over to anger and not to the righteousness of God. As we allow ourselves to be controlled by our emotions and not by the Holy Spirit. See, when we commit adultery, we, it's not just a sin against our own body or the body of somebody else. It's a sin against the Lord as we uh, hold with contempt something that God has designed to be very precious a commitment, a union that is not simply just human to human, man to woman, but also before the Lord. And yet, Jesus didn't commit any sin. He didn't do 
anything wrong. No sin horizontal and definitely not vertical. And yet he bore the punishment without so much as a peep. This isn't right. It's not fair. And yet it was the only way to accomplish our salvation. It was the only way that the wrath of God could be satisfied. It was the only way that Christ could stand in our place silently. See, this was the plan of God to win his children, to save his elect, to draw in his sheep. And as you hear these things, as you see that Christ has stood in our place, that he was sentenced on our behalf, let this lead you right now to the Lord. Maybe you are seeing for the first time what Christ did on your behalf, that you have never seen that, that it was Jesus who stood silently, who took the accusations, who stuck, took the condemnation, who received the punishment that we deserved. And right now, as you're hearing the words of my mouth, as you are feeling the conviction of the Holy Spirit, go ahead and just tell God, that should have been me. That should be me. And in the same breath, tell Christ, thank you. I did nothing to deserve your grace and mercy. As a matter of fact, I hated you. It's murderous towards you in my heart and murderous towards others. And I get to go free while you willingly, silently walked this road for me. See, Christ stood in our place silently and also steadfastly. So here's kind of our second main point of this whole passage. Not only did silent Jesus, uh, was he sentenced in our place, but steadfast Jesus won't be deterred from the cross. Steadfast Jesus won't be deterred from the cross. Now we've worked our way through this, but I want to kind of lay another layer for you to see what, just how steadfast Christ was in this whole mission. See, he endures to the end. He endures to the end. At the beginning of the service, I read Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, but I want to read for you uh, Hebrews 12, 3. The next verse, as we think about the passage in Mark, hear this, it says, Consider him, it's Christ, who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, oh yeah, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Consider Christ, look to Christ who endured from sinners such as hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. See, think here, kind of zoom out with me back in Mark 15. Jesus is so steadfast here that not even an unjust government, an ungodly crowd, and unrelenting soldiers could deter him from the cross. And this only adds to just how profound this plan is. See, Jesus here uh, has all of a sudden turned from a uh, beloved by the public to now a public enemy. Here as everybody. Like, look at the, how, how encompassing this is here. As I said, it, here is a, a government that is entirely unjust. Pilate just going with the whims of the people, trying to, uh, you know, satisfy uh, the crowds. Here's not a man concerned with justice, but just concerned with popularity. It's an unjust government taking away liberties when they are meant to uh, do good, and to do good to those who do good, and to punish those who are evildoers. Here we see an ungodly crowd. They're riding their public, the, you know, the, these public demonstrations when we desire to live in peace with one another. And here is, if we've ever seen it, police brutality, martial law, if you will, as Jesus is treated horribly. This is what everybody fears. 
It's in times like these and in the midst of our world when it's like the worst possible situation. You've probably seen memes. You've seen the fake news. You've seen things with here we have a government out of control. We have rioting and public demonstrations and we have martial law, police brutality. This is like, you know, uh, the worst case scenario. And in many ways, that is exactly what Jesus is enduring as he heads to the cross, face set in the mission, nothing would deter him, not even the most horrible uh, societal circumstances would knock him off course. His face was set on the cross, the mission, and he endured it silently, steadfastly for God's glory and our good. It would be a mistake to read this passage and to see Jesus as the victim He's not just caught up in these horrible circumstances. No, everything, as we've said all along, is going exactly according to plan. Jesus is headed towards the cross to stand in our place that we might be saved. He's headed toward the cross that not only would the penalty of sin be uh, taken care of on our behalf, but also the power of sin over us broken. And see, this is where the Hebrews 12 leads us, to consider Jesus. See, as you think about your own situation, the circumstances of your life right now, maybe as your body is growing weary, as there are physical needs that uh, that you have, there's uh, worries about your financial security. We're to consider Jesus so that we do not grow weary. Maybe your heart is anxious, you're worrying, you're up late at night, you're fretting, you're given to panic. Consider Jesus so that you will not be faint-hearted. See, the power of sin has been broken so that we would grow in Christ. The Spirit of God has been given to us as a seal, as a guarantee, as an encouragement, as a comfort to us. As we consider what Christ went through, as we weigh our situation and the balances and put Christ's situation, consider, consider what Christ went through. And as we look to Christ, we are strengthened. We're given encouragement are given the endurance that we need, the steadfastness that we need in these days so that we won't give up. See, church, listen to what the silent, steadfast one is saying. Look to the one in this passage who is unchanging, who is undeterred. See, the Lord is unmoved by this situation. He is unmoved by the coronavirus. His plans remain unaltered. The gospel still advances. The Great Commission is still our mandate. The church is still an essential service. Our worship, our walk, and our work are still necessary so that more and more and more can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ so that you can endure to the end so that Christ will be exalted as he deserves. Would you now pray with me as we consider these things? As God's spirit does his work in your heart, even as you're sitting there in your home. Let's pray together. God in heaven, thank you for your word. Christ, thank you for this timely example Thank you for uh, your goodness towards us. Thank you for your eternal word that was written for us in these days. Protect and preserve us now, Christ. I pray in your name. Amen. 
Hey Redemption, I hope that your online and in-home worship was an encouragement for your soul today as we got into God's word together and that it will fuel you this week to be uh, uh, filled with all hope and joy and peace in believing. I hope that this week you are, uh, even though we're scattered, you're able to connect with somebody even now after the service that you can pray for them, that you can encourage them, that you can share something that was impactful or meaningful to you this morning. Let's connect even uh, on uh, our socials and through technology this week as we stay connected uh, to one another. Would you hear these words from 1 Peter 5 by way of benediction? It says this, And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Hey, Redemption, you are loved. We'll see you next week.